I'm Scott Young. I'm the user experience and assessment librarian at Montana State. Um, uh, this project is, um, uh, I work on this project with Connie, who was not able to be here today, but she's an incredible student and a testament to what's possible when we collaborate with students. So I really want to recognize her and um, know her absence. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. We're going to start with about 45 minutes. I'm going to talk about an overview of the, pro the work that I've been doing in this area. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the practical components of what we're going to do. Um, the, the goal of today's session is to, um, to give you some new tools and some new techniques to help you um, work in a participatory way with whatever communities you want to work with. Um, so we'll also think about all the different ways that we can apply participation. Could be in faculty meetings, staff meetings, working with students. It's a really flexible, adaptable approach. So we'll have some fun thinking about that. Um, but also, at the end of the day today, we're going to try to come up with some ideas, some practical, implementable ideas um, that you can take home to your campuses or maybe stay within the Alliance for supporting Indigenous students. So we're going to try to practice the whole process of participatory design. We're going to condense it into one day, which I think will work. Um, so it's going to be an intense day. We'll ask a lot of you, but um, you all look like great people, so I know you can do it. Um, yeah, and also want to say thanks to the Alliance. The Alliance is awesome. Um, I don't know how Montana is not in the Alliance, but I'm going to talk to the right people. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm Scott. That's my title. That's the institution I work at. <clears throat> Before we go further, um, here's a map of um, First Nations and Indigenous peoples across the North American continent. Um, this map was produced by a cartographer in Canada, um, available at firstnationsseeker.ca. And it, it charts where indigenous people were pre-contact according to linguistic histories. Uh, so this, this map is amazing because you can really see the diversity of people that were and still are here. Um, so here's where we are right now, up there in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Um, zooming in, we can see really the density and the diversity of all the people that are here. So just want to acknowledge that, um, acknowledge our gratefulness to the stewards of this land. Um, and that Oregon is home to a really incredible diversity of Native nations. Um, here they are, right here. Um, so, at the same time, I want to acknowledge um, the limits of acknowledgments such as this. So this is a great article published last year, The Limits of uh, Settlers' Territorial Acknowledgments. Um, the authors say that no matter how detailed and considerate a territorial acknowledgement spoken in a settler spaces such as this one, beautiful as it is, it can never be more than a move to innocence um, if it's not combined with concrete actions embedded in relationships to solidarity. So, as we move forward through the day, um, consider how we can um, create new relationships or deepen existing relationships with the tribal peoples um, in Oregon through this process. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the principles of participatory design, um, what it looks like in practice. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some research and design around building a participatory toolkit specifically with and for um, Native students on my campus. Um, so there's some research results there um, and some ideas about how to do this with specific populations. Um, so thinking about definitions, understandings, and applications. Um, I want to note some funding um, for this work for my campus, so the Office of the Provost and President and the library, and then our campus's Native American Studies Department. And when we first started thinking about this, the question we had is, how can we ensure that Native American undergraduate students feel welcome and empowered on campus? And then as we kept going on this work, we realized that we started to think more critically about the way we were phrasing this, feeling about students feeling welcome and empowered and there's something about that phrasing that still centers the white experience, mm -hmm. and it's sort of on us to make sure that Native students feel welcome. And so, you know, that's so hard for us to do because we're, of course, always at the center. So, thinking critically about that, um, there's our early description. And we, want, we wanted to go a little further. And so, um, Eve Tuck is a really great thinker and scholar and practitioner in this area. And at a talk last year, um, she, she rephrased this in a way that we thought was really helpful. And she said, how do we build a university that deserves indigenous students? And this is such a, such a great way of thinking about it because it does take it farther than 
just feeling welcome because that still assumes that it's our home. And so how do we reverse that a little bit and try to do better for these students and with these students? So um, one way into that is participate, participation in design. So the way we define participatory design is as a socially active, politically conscious, conscious values-driven approach to co-creation. So social, socially active means that it's focused on social justice, producing better life outcomes for more people. Politically conscious means that it recognizes that there is different power levels at play um, in participation. Um, and values driven means that it has a set of principles that guide its work. Um, and co-creation means that we're building things together. Um, we're determining our future together. And that's where the real fun part comes in, as we'll see today. Uh, the theory of participation um, poses two essential roles, the designers and the users. The designers are those who are professionally responsible for the design product, whatever we're building. It could be a space, it could be a service, it could be a tool. And then the users are the people that interact with that thing. Um, so on our campus, we can translate this to sort of like the student and the professional. So we're the professionals. We're the ones that allocate the resources, make the decisions about, for example, what this beautiful room looks like. I don't know if students had input on this room, um, a participatory approach would make sure that they do, and that students practice, and they gave feedback, and they said, is this acoustically right, and et cetera. And so um, we recognize that there are tensions that exist between those two people, the users and the designers, the students and the professionals, um, because some of those people have more power and knowledge than the others. And so, like with students and professionals in higher ed, so participatory design is about seeing the imbalance of knowledge and power where it exists, and then trying to smooth that out a little bit. So I'll just talk quickly about one example of what this looks like with indigenous communities. Um, a participatory process for the design of um, housing in First Nation community just north of here. So this project was about designing housing on the Kitamont Reserve in the heights of First Nation in British Columbia. Um, it involved uh, the nation along with teams of professional architects in collaboration with researchers at the University of Victoria. This was in 2009. Um, the participants worked in direct collaboration together with interviews and on-site workshops driving the process of mutual learning that resulted in prototyping new housing models. The project responds to a housing crisis specifically affecting First Nation communities in Canada by aiming to develop culturally appropriate housing types that the nation could implement then in future development of housing in their community. So there was a desire to support and empower this community in the design of its own housing. So through a series of design workshops, similar to what we're going to do today, the architects in the nation identified three key social groups. There were single people in the community, elders, and then large extended families. And so here we see a floor plan for a single person in the community. Uh, several priorities were identified. Um, accessibility, particularly for elders. Energy efficiency, community members were concerned for utility bills. Um, and then cultural aesthetics. So there was a widespread interest in incorporating symbols, carvings, crests of local cultural heritage into housing design. So community members desired, in addition, large and flexible spaces to accommodate extended family gatherings that included food preparation and feasting activities. So here, oh, here we see what some of that can look like. So the authors state that through community consultation, um, the housing designs should and could accommodate traditional cultural activities. Um, foster cultural identity, strengthen family bonds, and educate youth. So this project highlights some of the principles of participatory design. And I will tell you what those are. Participation, mutual learning, equal expertise, shared power, co-creation and co-determination, democracy, and equity. Participatory design starts with, it, it has its roots in 1970s Scandinavia, where Denmark, Sweden, Norway, their uh, democratic traditions merged with systems design at the time. Um, so some of the early participatory projects involved um, uh, trade union workers at uh, newspaper shops. And so as typesetting was moving from um, a manual process into an automated process, the newspaper trade union wanted to involve the newspaper workers in the creation of automated tools that then they would use every day. So that's kind of where this started. And when we talk about participation in our context, this allows students to transcend to a position of trusted and legitimate participant in the design process. We're not just designing for them and hope that they like it and use it. Um, we can go deeper in design with them. Mutual learning happens when participants grow together and share knowledge together. 
Um, so this is a really cool thing when it happens. Um, we, since we have so many people from across the Alliance coming together today, we've arranged our small groups with a mix of institutions. So we're hoping that mutual learning can happen today. Um, and when, when we bring these different people together, a big, an important part of this is recognizing that we're all bringing different expertise to the table. Um, and so we want to involve the skills and the knowledge of everyone in the participatory group. And so when we think about students and professionals, we also want to acknowledge that students are, are experts in their own way, in their own situation. Students are experts at being students. Um, and so to accomplish this, we need to share our power. People who have more power need to be able to give up their power to let other voices come in and help make decisions. So for those who have a privileged position, thinking about how we can um, elevate those who may be invisible or weaker in the existing structures. And so this leads to um, co-creation where we create things together. Um, and even further than that, um, shaping a shared future together. And then the underpinning uh, value of democracy, <coughs> the right to have a voice, um, and the right to have that voice matter. And leading towards equity in not only opportunity, but also outcomes. Um, and so looking at structures that oppress some and don't allow for equitable outcomes. So um, being really attuned to that, particularly we can name whiteness, we can name masculinity, we can name patriarchy and colonialism, all of that is a part of this process. So summing this up, the main approach to participatory design has been about paying attention to power relations and providing uh, resources with a view towards empowering traditional marginalized groups. So as we move forward today, um, keep these principles in mind. Um, think about how we can enact those today, um, especially mutual learning, equal expertise. Got a lot of diversity in the room in terms of where you're coming from, professional situations. So, uh, so we'll see how we do that. Okay, I'll talk about how we've done this at, at my institution, Montana State University. So at MSU, we have over 700 native students enrolled, which for us is 4% of the student population. We actually have even more now going into the fall. We're almost at 5% and over 800 students, so we're really excited about that. But that means we have a responsibility to understand and serve these students. So um, for our participatory projects, um, we work to create a new library service in support of our native student population. Um, it was myself and four students on the project. Um, the project I'm going to talk about started in 16 and ended in 17. Um, and we did it to support um, native students and to improve their experience on campus. Um, and also to critically engage power structures in our library and to propose a new way of making decisions and a new way of working with students. So we did a series of workshops um, over a semester. We worked for about 12 weeks, uh, meeting once or twice a week. Um, started with interviews. We played a lot of design games, like we're going to do today. Um, we did things like storyboarding and prototyping. Uh, here we are in our workspace. Um, we're drawing a vehicle right here. Um, but so yeah, this, this is our great design space. Um, we played things like um, the vision cards. We're going to play with our vision cards today, so we'll do some exercises around that, and we'll be using this deck, actually. Um, so for our vision cards, um, we're going to do this exercise today where um, we asked, I asked the students to select a few cards that depicted how they viewed the library. A lot of these design games, as we'll see, it just creates a new, um, it like leverages metaphor and different structures to help people think creatively and communicate and dialogue around um, sometimes abstract ideas. So you could just ask a student, hey, tell me how the library is to you. Or you could give them some vision cards and say, pick three cards that show what the library is to you right now. So here's some of what the students selected. They said it was a little drab. It was a little bland, unfortunately, and not always very inspiring. But this is good data to get. And so then um, after that, we asked the students to select a few cards that depicted how they want the library to be. And here's what they selected. They want it to be dynamic and vibrant and blossoming and full of possibility. Um, things like this can be powerful evidence to travel outside of the participatory group as well. I can bring this to my administrators and say, what can we do here? Um, here's a great tool set, 75 Tools for Creative Thinking. Um, I'll share with everyone after um, the workshop all these resources and references um, so you can have a sense for how to get started on some of this. Um, so one of the activities is uh, build your vehicle. So we apply the metaphor of a car to the library where all the component parts of the vehicle are matched to the component parts of the library. 
And we ask the participants to draw a vehicle that represents the library. So here's what one of the students drew. Um, what's the steering wheel? Who's driving? Who are the passengers? What are the road conditions? So zooming in a little bit, um, this exercise allowed us to see that there was a perceived disconnect between the library and the students. So we've got a student driving, but the student says, wow, my student not know how to drive. Um, and then we've got like a librarian in the back with you know, maybe a storage facility with all these information resources. But they're not, they're kind of connected, but they're not talking directly. Mm -hmm. So we use this to talk about how the students feel disconnected in the library. Um, and so we zoomed in on this key problem of feeling disconnected. Um, so we wanted to create um, some sort of strategy or response to help the students feel more connected to the library. Um, so to explore that a little bit more, we um, made some collages, which is really fun. We're not going to make collages today, because that would take up like half the day, but that's a good one. Um, so the prompt here was um, um, kind of building on the vision card exercise, how you want the library to make you feel. <clears throat> so here's what one student um, produced. Uh, this shows the student feeling happy and confident and comfortable and relaxed and wise and strong and inspired and part of community and getting help and on a journey working towards a goal. Um, yeah, feeling very confident actually. The student said the figure on the lower right just really looked like confidence. So, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about some cultural biases, that was good. <laughs> So these are really generative collages because there's so much interpretation that happens. Uh, and so from there, um, the students, we did some other exercises to help generate more ideas and then evaluate the ideas, focusing down on what they thought would work for them. Um, when I went into the, into the process, I thought we were going to build something like a website or a digital tool because that was kind of technology oriented. Um, but the students, they wanted to go in a different direction. They wanted to go for something much more low tech, but what they thought would be more effective. So we used some exercises to talk through that. We decided together. That was like an example of me a little bit giving up my power because I could have said, no, I really think we should build a website. But ultimately what they wanted to build, or I should say what we wanted to build together, was um, a poster series. So we developed a uh, seven part promotional poster series matched with a social media campaign, MSU Live 101, that highlighted seven activities that the students felt were important for native students to understand happened in the library. We wanted to show the library as a place that native students would see and recognize as a place that they could go. Um, and so it started here with just finding the library. That's the one on the right. This is a paper prototyping project. Um, and so we sketched out what the posters could look like, identified the activities. It was things like the reference desk, which we see on the left here, the writing center. Um, we have a um, um, study tutors, uh, tutor service that they wanted to have. So we had a lot of fun sketching all this out, um, writing, writing the language for the, for the posters. Um, we did some storyboarding. <clears throat> so a student just sketched out quickly what the, what the poster should look like, and then we worked with our campus photographer to actually create these scenes, and we showed the storyboard to the photographer, and said, this is what we're imagining. Um, so that was a really great experience. And then the students used uh, Canva to design uh, the final posters. And these posters are still up all around campus. Here's four of them now in the Native American student center. Um, and so they're in buildings all across campus, they're in the library. Um, we use them at uh, uh, student orientations now in the fall um, because the, the seven activities string together into a story. And so um, it starts with the student finding the library, entering the library, going around all these different services. And so we can sequence the posters together. They stand alone, but we can also sequence them together to talk about um, how a student would experience the library. So those posters are available at this URL if you want to take a look at it. So that is participatory design at MSU. But then another thing happened as we were going through this. Um, participatory design is um, design tradition from Scandinavia. Um, which has its own colonial history in being applied to an indigenous student group. And there was something, something there that we needed to, again, think more critically about. And so I presented some of this work to the Tribal College Librarians Institute, which is um, an annual professional development retreat that happens on my campus every summer. 
Lorene Roy is an iSchool faculty at the University of Texas. Um, she is incredibly smart. She was in the audience. We talked about this work, and she came up afterwards. She said, I think you need to think more about how these two communities are coming together, this, the participatory designers and the indigenous researchers and practitioners and students. And so that just set us on a completely different course, um, which, is, which is what's taken us to today, thinking, thinking better and more about how to culturally appropriately bring Scandinavian participatory design together with indigenous students. So more than just participatory design, we're kind of thinking what is indigenous participatory design look mm -hmm. like. Um, this is where I really wish Connie were here today, but we'll just imagine her spirit in the room. So we asked ourselves this question, how can we indigenize participatory design? And we figured that we broadly across disciplines so we researched other examples of participatory designers um, working with indigenous and First Nations communities in the fields of architecture and food systems and health sciences. Um, we also wanted to understand how we, the, the two of us, Connie and I, could deepen our own participatory design experience and practice with a stronger view towards indigenous histories and cultures and epistemologies. And so, and so we're, we're working on that. We're working on connecting this participatory design tradition with an already really strong tradition of indigenous research methodologies. So we see connections here. We see connections here. Um, decolonization of research methods calls for the research to participate in the research process and for researchers to be committed to an action-oriented research process in which researchers are activists dedicated to social transformation. So what's great about what we're seeing here is it, it activates the researcher oh, beyond the neutrality, to a place where we're, we're taking a stand, we're seeing the, the real social and political impacts, and we're working towards really intentional, purposeful outcomes. So with a focus on shared power and co-creative participation, the tradition of participatory design finds common ground with decolonizing and indigenizing research approaches that seek to address historical imbalances of power and participation. So Margaret Kovach, an education researcher, Plains Cree and Salto ancestry writes that the power lies with the research participant, the storyteller. So when we empower indigenous storytelling um, as participants in the design process, we are in some measure indi indigenizing our research and practice areas. And so for us, the library and the university. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're building right now, um, what we're calling the Indigenous Participatory Design Toolkit. So it's a new prototype design tool um, created with and for Native students and staff on my campus. Um, it's based on new research that we conducted, um, a literature review, but also interviews and a survey with Native students and staff on our campus. Um, and the goals of the tool are to address the challenges and amplify the strengths of Native students. That's, that's the first goal. Um, enhance empathy and understanding from non-Native and Native um, admin, staff, and students on campus. Um, empowering Native students, producing new ideas for better services, and then to create a safe, playful space for creative and critical thinking. And that's something that I think we can accomplish today. That last one. Um, so this is who we talk to on our campus. Um, we think this research is replicable too, so um, if you have motivation or time to ask some questions on your campus about this, we think this can very easily be so um, we asked about the roles and the goals and the motivations, the factors that help and hinder success, the most helpful services on campus for Native students, frustrations and obstacles, um, and then we asked a magic button question, which is also kind of a design thing that we'll get to in a second. Um, okay, so then based on the interviews, we created a survey, which would produce some comprehensive responses about how our Native students experience campus. Um, so we sent it out. We have an American Indian Council on our campus. You probably have something similar on your campuses, a Native Student Success Office. They were really great collaborators for us. Um, so we asked about age, tribal affiliation, barriers of being a student, strengths of students, um, and then this magic button question. So we had 45 responses, 37 unique responses, which showed the diversity within our campus, our campus's Native community. Um, we can see some of that diversity come through in some of the demographic results. So the age ranged from 18 to 51 for Native students on our campus. So lots of non-traditional, um, or even when we say non-traditional, you know, that sort of centers a certain um, viewpoint. But a really 
wide range of, of ages. So the mean was 26.5 for Native students in the survey population. So from the interviews, we identified um, a list of what we saw as common strengths and challenges. So we asked um, the respondents to select from that preset list of strengths. Um, and this is, this is what they responded in terms of what was resonating. Um, so the top five selections for Native strengths on campus were sense of self-determination, academic success, resilience, humor, joking, and laughing, um, and friends and family. And in addition to that, being able to navigate among uh, different cultures, balancing physical, mental, and spiritual health, cultural pride and identity, then being a part of Native campus communities, um, like TRIO, uh, which is a national program, um, and then being a part of Native campus spaces. Um, that was really important. We're actually building a new building on our campus um, for the Native community, which is uh, we're really excited about. Um, so then they were also able to add, um, add their own responses. So some things that we didn't capture in the interviews, but the survey respondents wanted to make sure they communicated to us that they saw as strengths in their experience on campus, um, gathering and preparing indigenous foods, um, parenting, being a leader and being able to help my peers when needed, relationships with faculty and arts and crafts. Um, so same with the strengths, we also asked about barriers and challenges. Um, so we asked the participants to respond to a pre-set pre list of challenges that we created based on the interviews again. Um, and here's what we found. Um, the top five were funding for school. Um, sometimes students are really living on a razor edge in terms of their capacity to be on campus. So things like even paying for gas to get to campus can be a huge barrier, and a student won't go to class as a result of that. And then as a result of that, they'll miss a day or a week, and then as a result of that, they're more likely to drop out. So funding is a huge, um, a huge aspect. Um, connected to that is also uh, money for food, there's lots of um, hunger uh, um, across all students, but particularly this community. Um, and housing. housing is a huge concern. Um, I know that's an issue here in Portland. Um, and in addition to that, um, self-doubt, um, just uh, uncertainties about being, being on campus, time management, um, cultural differences when encountered with navigating a predominantly white institution um, such as MSU, and then missing home, home and family. Um, a lot of students travel a long distance to be at our institutions. And as a result of that, they're leaving behind their strong bonds back at home. And there's such a distance there, both geographically and also mentally and spiritually, that, that it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, and in, in addition to that, feeling isolated, the housing concern, um, orientation to a new complex environment. Um, in Bozeman, and maybe this is true for some of your campuses as well, um, our town, our small town in Montana, is pretty cosmopolitan. And we draw a lot of rural students. And so our town is the most urban that a lot of our students have ever seen before. Our library, as small as it is, is the biggest library most students have ever seen before. So that's something that is not always apparent or obvious to us as professionals, because we've been to much bigger libraries, but a lot of our students haven't. Um, so moving down the list, lack of identity, um, uncertainties, um, you know, particularly among the young people about that, um, and then childcare. Um, so, some short answers to what are some challenges and barriers not fitting into the Native community. Through our diversity, our 800 students, we have a lot of individual tribal members, and so um, finding co cohesiveness among or within the tribal communities can actually be really difficult. Um, you know, we have like a, a Blackfeet member and a Crow member, they're really different, and so sometimes they have um, just difficulties connecting around them which is something that's really important for our non-native administrators and faculty and staff to understand. Um, the ability to self-advocate when things seem overwhelming. You know, like self-advocacy is definitely like a white masculine value that a lot of native students don't really, um, aren't really able to um, naturally um, uh, respond to. Uh, and then um, one student said, my native American identity is not universally accepted, so that's a tough one. Um, I also want to recognize that I'm a white person talking about how the Native community is. Um, this um, presentation was designed with Connie's co-participation, and so it feels a little weird, sort of, like, as a researcher, like reporting on this to you, saying like, Native communities like this. So I just want to acknowledge that this is not, not quite right. Um, um, so we did ask um, this magic button question, which was, 
At the end of the survey, we said, imagine you had a magic button that could instantly make one thing possible to improve your experience on campus. What would that magic button do? So we're sort of asking students to think of the future, use their imagination. Um, and this is, this is some of what they said. We did a content analysis on the responses. Um, the top three um, uh, focused on infrastructure on campus, so we build it, um, new funding. Um, but, um, but diversity on campus, more diversity, um, was, was a huge, huge response. So an example for that, um, one of the respondents said, having our own space for cultural values would show how much pride we have in ourselves as a native community, and it would also show us how much MSU cares for its native student population. Buildings and budgets, of course, send a huge message. Um, in, uh, for the funding category, one person said, um, would pay for my school so I didn't have to work as much. And for diversity, um, they'd like MSU to be as culturally diverse as a university in a major city, like Los Angeles would be. And then even more pointed, stop the weird looks and weird comments from non native um, this was one of the specific cultural things that came up in not only the participatory design project, but also this research. There was something about, you know, we're familiar with library anxiety and feeling intimidated um, for students coming into a library and seeing a lot of expert users in the building. They already know where all the books are, where, this, where their favorite study places are, how to use the library. That can be really tough. But specific then, in addition to that, is seeing so many white faces in the library already. So a native student goes into the library and they see this whole sea of expert white people and that's just really hard because they don't know how those people are going to treat them. Um, that was something that one of the interviewers said, which was, which was really um, powerful. She just said, I don't know how people are going to interact with me in any, any point on campus, um, non-native people. So there's a lot of cultural training in that. And I know you have um, diversity initiatives on your Campuses, but we can, of course, always go farther and do more. And so we think participatory design is one way, one way to do that, help us go farther and to do more. So we synthesized all of this and we identified 10 strengths and 10 challenges for the native students on our campus. Some of this might be familiar to the native students on your campuses. Racism and stereotyping, cultural differences, lack of identity, housing, family care, self-doubt, funding, distance, isolation, and then just some practical things, keeping organized. But the strengths, campus communities and spaces, friends and family, cultural pride and identity, navigating among different cultures, self-care, academic success, self-determination, resilience, humor, joking, laughing, that's a big one. Um, and then leadership, leadership within their communities. So um, we have, we're working on creating a toolkit that can bring native and non-native um, people together on campus around these strengths and challenges to help people understand in a better and deeper way what's really going on with Native students. So this is our sort of like prototype card design. Um, so here is a card for self-determination. Um, the language is Lakota, which is Connie's tribal affiliation. Um, we have a quote from our interviews. Um, and so this one says, when I have a goal, I always strive for it. Um, and then a description of what we heard from, from the research. Um, many students are focused on goals such as graduation, employment, and community impact and a sense of personal sovereignty and a fire within, that was a quote from one of the interviews, drives values-based behavior. Um, here's another one, academic success and, and resilience. So these cards are high-level representations of some of what our native community experiences on campus. We have cards for the barriers and the challenges as well, so self-doubt. Um, sometimes I put myself down being like, I'm not good enough, why am I doing this? So this self-doubt creates barriers, um, it creates conflicts, it, it takes value away. Um, feelings of uncertainty, internal disputes, and, and doubts can present um, obstacles to learning, engaging on campus, and achieving goals. So even though this can be difficult to talk about, naming it and representing it here helps us address it. So keeping organized, um, just make, make it to campus. The clock as a colonial metaphor and an actual colonial tool is really present, um, and, then, and then cultural differences. So that's just a few of the cards. Um, so we have 10 challenges and 10 strengths. Um, and then we have 10 exercises, some of which we'll be doing today. Um, so five for sort of inquiring into the problem, and then five for trying to address 
that those problems by creating some new ideas for services or spaces. Um, so here's one two author story, which we will be doing today. It's super fun. Um, so we have instructions for how to do this. Um, those are the instructions there. We're just doing something similar to this. Um, but the idea is that we get people together into a room. We talk, we, we name the strengths, we name the challenges, and then we have some structured exercises that help people talk about it. And then as a result of that, we can better understand, empathize with, and support the new students. And really, even though this is specific to indigenous design, some of our activities today will be um, more broadly applicable, so you can sort of think about all the different ways we can apply it. Here's an exercise called Walk a Mile, where you identify all the stakeholders present in a situation, and then you ask, um, if they behave differently, how would that go? Um, so you sort of walk a mile in other people's shoes to imagine how they might act. Um, so we have a whole set of exercises. There's the build your vehicle. Um, and we can sequence some of these out. So um, strength building is an exercise. So um, focus on one strength, for example, take academic success. Um, and then combine it with this exercise called Build Billboard, which imagines into the future, like if you saw a billboard that represented something great that happened, what would it say? So something great that happened about academic success. Um, and then that can, that can produce some new insights that can help, um, help enhance Native student support. So here's, here's what we're trying to do with this. Um, some of those goals again. And so, We want to highlight some specific responses to our survey question that we think is relevant. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your experience at Montana State University? So the comments demonstrate the motivation for the project. Um, one student told us that the staff and administration really do not seem to understand Native culture and history. Listening from a position of cultural humility would be a great place to begin dialogue. So, this may be happening at your campuses as well. The higher up you go, the less understanding there is of student experiences. So we're hoping that things like this and participatory processes can build better bridges of communication and support. Um, we should have more Native American opportunities to help people, um, help educate people about us and our beliefs. So this is also an educational tool when we talk about um, the strengths and the challenges. Um, yet, despite these challenges, our students are excellent and they are exceeding, succeeding. So, the toolkit and participatory processes can be a way to address um, the first two comments, but also address these or amplify these second two. I, I love it despite the difficulties, and I love my experience so far. So, the toolkit and participatory processes are intended to break down barriers between Native students and non Native professionals by creating a safe space for structured dialogue around the real problems um, in support of real solutions so that we can better help our Native students be successful at their institutions. Um, so what are some of the outcomes of participatory design? When we do all of this work together, what, what does it lead to? Um, we'll return to Kobach for this. Um, given the extractive, exploitative history of research within Indigenous communities, efforts to mitigate power differentials in all aspects of research are warranted. So whether using an indigenous methodolo methodological approach, like particip participation or not, attention to methods should encompass both pragmatic and political outcomes. So that last part is really important, both the practical out outcomes and the political outcomes. So, um, so practically, we're trying to create new ways to co-create services between Native and non-Native students and staff. So the toolkit that we're building is an outcome in itself, as would any services or new, new ideas for support. But, but politically, we're looking to elevate student voices, native student voices, um, to interrogate existing power structures, create new structures, um, ultimately leading to a more just world where there's less power imbalance, there's less social inequity. Um, those are some of the fundamental driving issues. We maybe won't see that those goals be accomplished soon or even in our lifetimes, but if we can contribute to whatever measure of power that we have and we're able to, then that's something. Um, quoting Sarah Kenzior, she says, part of the win is the fight itself. So the process itself is an outcome. So, um, so this is kind of where we're headed. We're looking at more practical applications of the toolkit. Um, for non-native participants, we're thinking that there could be like professional development programming that produces discussions around these topics. Um, for native participants, um, we've applied the posters and orientation programming. We think we could do the, the workshop. 
that the toolkit itself could also be an orientation activity. Um, and then bridging, bridging these, these, two, these two communities, bringing them together around common goals of supporting, supporting students. So how can you practice indigenous participatory design at your institution as well? That's what we're here today to do. Um, there are tools like this. A lot of the exercises today are adapted from tools like this. I'll go over some of these a little bit more. Um, the toolkit is built at this URL. If you'd like to go check it out, blue.montana.edu slash indigenous design toolkit. So I've got all the cards with a little bit of project background. Um, and again, I'll, I'll share the slides. I do want to note some barriers. Um, it's a time and resource intensive process. It's easy for us or anyone who's in a position of power or decision making to just make the decision and move on. Um, but this process asks us to slow down, to involve more people, um, to do the work of consensus building, um, and that takes time. Um, and so you're, you may not immediately have institutional values that want to work in that way or would support that kind of work. So that in itself is, um, is a challenge and a barrier. Um, and those power relations are really deeply rooted. The status quo, as we know, is powerful. And so the people who really would, we, we'd look to to give up some of their power, they, sometimes they just really don't want to do that. So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> but through participation in design, Native students and other students, anyone who has been disempowered can be empowered as equal in higher education. Um, and together we can build universities that deserve indigenous students. So that is the sort of concept talk. Thank you for being here this morning to hear that. 